So Hodgkin lymphoma, what you need to know. Um, let us get started with it. So the incidence of lymphoma in Australia is where we're going to start. So there's over 6,400 people that were diagnosed with lymphoma and CLL in 2018. So lymphoma is actually the sixth most common cancer in men and women in Australia and the most common cancer in our 15 to 29 year old population. And that makes it also the third most common cancer in our pediatric population. So our zero to 14 year olds. There are over 80 different subtypes of lymphoma and some of those are very rare and I've never seen them and potentially will never see them in my career but there are patients out there that do have them um, and so it's important for us to be educated about them. Um, the subtype of um, lymphoma's number has actually doubled in the last 20 years as we spend more time investigating the ins and outs of this um, disease. So the prevalence of lymphoma in Australia is high. Um, it's still a rare disease but it's good for us to understand what it is and and that's why Lymphoma Australia is an advocate for lymphoma because we don't want anyone who is diagnosed with it to go through it alone and we want everyone to know what their options are as well. So in order to understand lymphoma, we've got to cover some of the basics. So lymphoma is an umbrella term for a group of cancers that are all involved in the lymphatic system. So this cancer can occur in any body or tissue or organ in the body, um, and it mainly affects B and T cell lymphocytes. So our lymphocytes are a type of specialized white blood cell that are important in our body's working immune system. So there are different types of lymphocytes, as you can see there on the slide there is T cells and B cells. So our T cells are kind of like these free agents that um, roam around the body and patrol and they kill abnormal cells or foreign body bacteria viruses. Our B cells are responsible for our memory immunity and they produce our antibodies. So the lymphatic system uh, branches out to all of our tissues in the body. It drains excess fluid from our body tissues. It filters it and it returns it to the bloodstream. It is also the place that we store our specialized white blood cells like our lymphocytes. They're often stored in our lymph nodes and some other key organs involved um, in our immune system. So how does lymphoma actually develop? So lymphoma develops when a mistake happens during cell division. So we call this mistake a mutation or an abnormality, and that changes the DNA inside that cell. And this is called a mutation, as we said. Um, mutations can create abnormal cells that stop responding to the body's normal controls and their signals. So some of the consequences of this is that your, your abnormal cell might divide when it's not supposed to, or it might not die off. So each cell has a set life cycle and eventually that life cycle is supposed to come to an end. Some cells that become mutated and have DNA changes within them might not never be indicated or receive the message that tells them to die off. And this can lead to that abnormal cell not dying and instead dividing and creating more of itself. As you can see in the picture there, the mutation occurs and then it can lead to further mutations and further development of that mutation. Some of the outcomes of this abnormal cell division is that of our lymphocytes, when our lymphocytes become abnormal and divide, they can collect in our lymph nodes or our spleen and then therefore you get a swollen lymph node so patients will often present with swollen lymph nodes and that's because those abnormal cells have clumped together in the lymph node or the spleen enlarging the spleen our immune system can become weak um, and these cells can infiltrate into our bone marrow and our bloodstream so what causes lymphoma? So we can understand, um, I guess, the cell biology, the DNA changes, but we don't actually know what causes those DNA changes, those abnormalities to occur. We know that um, historically there's no connection between family history. So lymphoma is not a hereditary disease. There is no gene that we can test for to figure out if you've got lymphoma or you're going to develop lymphoma. Um, people who have family members that are diagnosed with lymphoma might be classified as an increased risk, but that doesn't mean that that lymphoma runs in the family as such. So there is increased risk factors um, and some of those include previous infections. So EBV 
um, Epstein-Barr virus is, a, is the virus that's often responsible for your glandular fever. Um, hepatitis C and HIV are all viruses that can, um, I guess, change our immune system, um, ability to function, um, and therefore have been linked to potential um, developments of lymphoma. Chemical exposure from pesticides, fertilizers, and solvents. Um, so some films of Roundup um, in farming communities have been linked to some T cell lymphomas. Previous organ transplant has been linked, um, and that's because a person who undergoes an organ transplant will also be on prolonged use of immunosuppressants, so taking drugs that stop their body from rejecting that organ transplant. Um, and long-term use of those can interfere with the functioning of your immune system and be linked to lymphoma. Pre-existing autoimmune disorders as well. So essentially things that interfere with the functionality and the work of your immune system can lead to um, Will, can be linked to an increased risk of developing lymphoma. So classification. So the classifications of lymphoma is very broad. So as I said, lymphoma is an umbrella term for a lot of different types um, of cancer that come from this lymphocyte bloodline. So this page here, this picture is not meant um, to be read. It's just a demonstration of how many classifications of lymphoma are there. So that's actually only half of the list um, of lymphomas that are classified currently. And there's actually over 80 different subtypes. Um, and so this just gives us an idea of how complex um, this disease is. Um, and it's also an evolving space. So lymphomas, we're learning more about them all the time and therefore changing classifications and reclassifying things to reflect research and discoveries. So there are 80 different subtypes of lymphoma, as I said, so that's a lot. Um, so it can be very confusing to understand what lymphoma is and, and what type of lymphoma you might have. So as I said, lymphoma is that umbrella term, and then you've got Hodgkin's lymphoma down there, which then further divides into either classical Hodgkin's or nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's. So that's Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can be further divided into B cell and T cell origin, and then also further divided again into indolent, which means slow growing, or aggressive, which means fast growing lymphomas. So as you can see, it is a very complex um, disease, um, and it can be a minefield trying to figure out how to navigate that. So the difference between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So Hodgkin lymphoma is a B cell lymphoma primarily. That's, that's what it is. It's develops from abnormal B cells. Um, and it usually is quite aggressive, usually a fast growing um, lymphoma and symptoms can come on quite quick um, and needs, usually needs treatment right away. Whereas non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's a lot more diversity within that terminology. So whereas Hodgkin's lymphoma is only a B cell lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's can be both a B cell or a T cell lymphoma. And not only that, non-Hodgkin lymphoma could be also fast growing or slow growing. So aggressive or indolent. Um, so in the indolent slow growing lymphomas, your symptoms can develop months to years before diagnosis. And sometimes people can even be accidentally diagnosed. So a patient might have follicular lymphoma and have no idea. Um, and then they go for a chest X-ray because they've had a cough or something. And then, oh, we've found enlarged lymph nodes they discover that you've got lymphoma. Um, whereas the aggressive lymphomas, their symptoms usually make themselves known quite quickly um, and a diagnosis happens quite fast. Not, not fast, fast, but faster than a slow growing lymphoma. So why do you need to know your subtype? What's, why as a patient is it important for you to understand what type of lymphoma you might have? Um, and knowing your diagnosis is important because as doctors, um, do, your doctor will depend upon your treatment um, based on your diagnosis. So knowing your diagnosis helps the doctors and the healthcare team treating you expect the behavior of your lymphoma. They understand it better. They know what treatment it will require. They can understand its prognosis and its future expectations. So as a patient, it's important for you as well to understand um, how your lymphoma is going to behave. Is it likely to relapse? Is it likely to be curable? Is it fast growing? Is it slow growing? These things are important for you to know so that you can understand what journey you're on in your lymphoma. And at Lymphoma Australia, we're really passionate about helping you as a patient be empowered to understand, which is why we have spent 
lots of time developing fact sheets about lots of different subtypes of lymphoma, which you can access on our website because we want you to know and understand the disease um, that you have in your body. So lymphoma symptoms. So the signs and symptoms can vary and they can be a bit vague. So sometimes patients have no symptoms, as we said earlier, and they're accidentally diagnosed. Other times they might have a painless swelling of lymph node, or they might have pain from an enlarged lymph node. Um, itching, fatigue, cold and flu symptoms, these are all things that patients can present with. Um, our B symptoms are unexplained weight loss, night sweats, and fevers. So your B symptoms are, um, certain symptoms that doctors take into account alongside other factors when they decide upon your treatment. So B symptoms can occur in around 25% of patients. Um, and so these things, people with Hodgkin lymphoma will often experience the unexplained white loss, the night sweats and the fevers. So your night sweats are severe, they're drenching um, through your pajamas and sometimes your sheets. Your fever is a temperature above 38 degrees um, and your weight loss is greater than 10% of your weight loss um, in about six months unintentionally. So lymphoma is hard to diagnose. So as you can see from those symptoms, lymphoma is a rare and it's a complex disease and the symptoms can be very vague. And for a doctor and a healthcare professional, it can be difficult to diagnose it because it's like putting together different pieces of a puzzle. Um, and doctors need to rule out other illnesses that are more likely. So when a patient presents with fevers and an enlarged lymph node, it's more likely that they'll have some sort of viral infection like glandular fever, as opposed to lymphoma. And so your doctor needs to rule those things out before they diagnose you. And that can be difficult for a patient to find out that they have lymphoma and they've been to the doctor several times. Um, and you feel like, oh, surely you should have picked this up by now. But it's helpful for you to understand that it is a rare disease, it is complex, and the symptoms aren't always um, like immediately obvious that it's lymphoma. So the average person actually visits their GP five times before receiving a lymphoma diagnosis. Um, so it's helpful for us to reflect upon. So how is it diagnosed? So you can't confirm a diagnosis of lymphoma without a biopsy. So a biopsy is definitely needed to confirm a diagnosis. So a lymph node biopsy um, is what we usually call an excisional node biopsy. It's a bit of a big term, but that's when they cut out a lymph node and they take it and they examine it under a microscope. You can do a core needle biopsy or a fine needle biopsy. Those things, um, they don't collect enough tissue. So we usually do a lymph node biopsy where we take that out and have a look at it. A bone marrow biopsy is not necessary for all patients. So we only do a bone marrow biopsy if we expect that lymphoma has potentially moved its way into the bone marrow space. So if it's in, in your bone marrow, then we might take a biopsy to a assess that and see if the lymphoma is in there. So we also do physical examination, taking a medical history, your blood tests, and often your full blood count might come back normal. So with your GP, they might order a blood test and it might come back normal. And that can also be misleading. Um, so staging scans will be done as well. So a PET scan, CT, MRI, um, and a lumbar puncture. Again, a lumbar puncture is not always indicated for all patients. So we do a lumbar puncture if we think that the lymphoma has infiltrated into the central nervous system space. Um, that's when we do a lumbar puncture. So then from our diagnosis, we stage the lymphoma. So this picture on the screen here, as you can see, um, has a little man um, and where the red dots are is obviously the indication of where the lymphoma is. So stage one, it's limited to one, one site and then stage five, a uh, four, sorry. Um, it's obviously spread into the bone marrow and potentially the central nervous system. So that line in the middle of um, that di that diagram is a divide. They divide the body kind of in half um, and then they, use that as a marker to see how far the lymphoma has traveled. So depending on how far it's advanced from um, the, its original spot or whatever, um, they stage it based on that, its progress. So lymphoma is a systemic disease, so through our lymphatic system, and it can travel very easily. So it can spread to many parts of the body. Um, and the stage doesn't necessarily indicate the prognosis, so the end result um, or, or the expected outcome. 
So the stage does impact the treatment that we choose for you. Um, and so it is important to know your stage, but it's also important to know that a lot of patients are actually diagnosed at stage three or four lymphoma. And a stage four lymphoma is a very different diagnosis to a stage four metastatic colon cancer or bowel cancer or breast cancer. So it's a very different disease. Lymphoma moves through the lymphatic system and it can move quite quickly. So it's very common for people to be diagnosed at a later stage in their lymphoma. So what scans are done um, with our, are associated with our diagnosis? So when you're diagnosed, you'll be done a PET scan and a CT scan to try and get a picture of where um, the lymphoma is, as you saw on the previous slide. We also do a bunch of baseline tests to, before treatment. Um, so before any treatment is started, we do baseline tests that evaluate the um, functioning of your heart and your lungs and other organs so that if we're going to give you treatment, we know how the treatment might affect those or how those organs are, are situated and how they're functioning. During treatment, um, people will often have a CT and PET scan done post cycle two of treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma and then post completion of treatment as well. After treatment has finished, a physical examination will be done and a, and a follow up basically every three months, but no more scans unless we think this is, um, the lymphoma has come back. So who is affected by Hodgkin's lymphoma if we're going to start talking about that? So it's the most common cancer that impacts the 15 to 25 year old age group. So it's quite common in young people. Um, there's a second prevalence of people 70 years and older, and it accounts for roughly 7% of all childhood cancers. So it does affect people of all ages. You can get Hodgkin lymphoma at any time in your life and it does affect men and women equally and it can affect people of all ethnicities so but it, there obviously are some people that are more there's more demographics that see it more so what is Hodgkin lymphoma it's an aggressive fast growing B cell lymphoma that accounts for roughly 15% of all B cell lymphomas and 10% of lymphomas overall so it affects around 650 Australians each year so that might sound like a lot, but it's actually quite rare in comparison to other diseases and, and the amount of population that we have in Australia as well. So there are two types of Hodgkin lymphoma. There's classical, which then has four further subtypes, and there's nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So Hodgkin lymphoma develops from abnormal B lymphocytes. It's named after Thomas Hodgkin, um, who was the guy who discovered it in 1832. Um, and Reed Sternberg cells are these funky looking cells that you can see on the picture there. They're abnormal large B cells um, that can be seen in a biopsy of Hodgkin lymphoma under the microscope. So when you get that lymph node biopsy taken, um, you know, you might present to the doctor with an enlarged lymph node, they might do a biopsy, they take that, have a look at it under the microscope, and they'll see these funky looking cells, and they're the Reed Sternberg cell. And that's, an, that's a hallmark of um, Hodgkin lymphoma. So non-Hodgkin lymphomas don't have that cell present. So classical Hodgkin lymphoma, as we said, there's classical Hodgkin's and then there's nodular lymphocyte predominant, and we're talking about classical right now. So classical Hodgkin lymphoma um, can be for, further divided into these four subcategories. Um, and some of our um, categories are more common than others. So you can see the top one's more common, it's 70%, um, and then it gets less and less um, as you go down. So all of those subtypes are treated the same, even though they look a bit different, and they're all described and differentiated based on how they look under the microscope. So when you take the biopsy again, you see those Reed Sternberg cells, but then the surrounding cellular structure um, looks a certain way. Um, and they describe it, the scientists will describe it one of four ways, um, and that will categorize the patient into one of these diagnoses. Um, the common symptoms for Hodgkin lymphoma is your fatigue, so tiredness and a lack of energy, shortness of breath, um, if they've got lymphoma in some of the lymph nodes in their chest, it might be causing them to struggle to breathe, a loss of appetite, um, fevers and weight loss are some symptoms that you might experience. So what about nodular lymphocyte predominant? So it's very rare. It's even more rare than the classical Hodgkin lymphoma. It only accounts for about 5% of all Hodgkin lymphomas. And it is typically slower growing. And because it is slightly different to classical, it is initially treated differently. So 
where is classical Hodgkin lymphoma when a diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma is given? Chemotherapy is pretty much your first go-to treatment. No your lymphocyte predominant, they don't necessarily need chemotherapy straight up. So they are treated a little bit differently. Um, at times. It's more common in the 30 to 50 year olds, this uh, nodular lymphocyte predominant, and it looks similar to other types of non-Hodgkin, and it doesn't always have as many Reed Sternberg cells present. So again, it can be difficult to diagnose. So the, what's the prognosis of Hodgkin lymphoma? So 90% cure rate. So with our first line chemotherapy regimes, 90% um, of our patient population um, can everyone still hear me okay? Or is my internet connection off? All right? Cool. Um, so 90% um, of patients who were treated with first line treatment will actually um, achieve a prolonged remission, which is great. Um, the other 10% of patients who are not cured with first line treatment can often be treated with second line options. So there are options um, in relation to those who don't respond um, having said that, no cancer is a good cancer. And so even if you are diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, um, it's still a hard journey um, and it can has it ups and downs, definitely. So, yep. so lymphoma management. So how we approach the management and the treatment of lymphoma really depends on some key elements. So the age of the patient when they're diagnosed, so kids and pediatrics have different chemotherapy protocols to adults um, and different um, things they can handle. Uh, past medical history, how the lymphoma is clinically behaving, if what symptoms you've presented with, the stage of the lymphoma, um, the personal preference of the patient, and the general health and well-being of both physical and mental of the patient as well. So lymphoma treatment, frontline treatment for um, Hodgkin lymphoma is chemotherapy and sometimes radiation therapy as well. Second line, so if your Hodgkin lymphoma doesn't respond to first line treatment or it returns after treatment, you could have antibody therapy, target therapy or a stem cell transplant. So there are options for people who don't respond to first line treatment. So for classical Hodgkin lymphoma, these are two standard chemotherapy protocols that are often used. So standard first line chemotherapy regime for early stage is ABVD, um, which is these chemotherapy drugs listed here, the doxorubicin, bleomycin, dimblastine, decarbazine. Um, so these drugs are given in four to six cycles, depending on the patient response, and sometimes radiation is included. So as we mentioned earlier in the scans, um, patients are often rescanned after cycle two. So they will say have two cycles of this ABVD. Your doctor might rescan after cycle two and then decide whether or not you need four more cycles or only two more cycles. Um, and a similar scenario will happen with the second um, chemotherapy protocol with for advanced disease, the escalated VA cop. So they will start off with your first two cycles and then depending on how the patient responds, they might even get downgraded from that um, VA cop protocol to the ABVD. So if you've responded quite positively to your VA cop protocol after your second cycle, your doctor might decide to downgrade you. And that's just because um, escalated disease, the escalated VA cop is a little bit more intense um, for more intense disease. So there are indications for that. So nodular lymphocyte predominant, as we said, it's rare. And often you don't need chemotherapy to treat it. So early stage disease without any B symptoms, um, they sometimes can just have some radiation alone. They might just remove the lymph node that it's involved in. Um, so do that surgery and then do some local radiation and then that might be it. If the disease does return, if the lymphoma comes back after that treatment, then they'll often go on to have chemotherapy and they'll use one of those two protocols that was um, listed for the classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So treatment side effects. So nausea and vomiting is quite common. Also a red orange discoloration of the urine um, because of the doxorubicin. So doxorubicin can also impact your cardiac function. So you often have to have um, different tests throughout um, your cycles to assess the function of your heart and make sure that it's still working well. You can have taste and smell alterations. So increased infection risk because of neutropenia. So that's your low white cell count and low neutrophils. Thrombocytopenia is a low level of platelets, um, which can lead to increased bruising and bleeding. 
oral mucositis, so painful mouth and swallowing, um, a loss of appetite, your fatigue, photosensitivity, peripheral neuropathy, hair loss, and also fertility. So your ABVD and your escalated BACOP can interfere with your fertility. So it's definitely recommended that if you're in childbearing years and you're interested in preserving your fertility, that before you commence treatment, you speak to a fertility specialist um, and talk about your options in that regard. And also if you've completed treatment, it's important for you to go talk to a fertility specialist if you're interested in having kids um, and having some sort of um, support through enabling you to do that. People do have kids after these treatments, um, but you can inter it can interfere with your fertility. It's also important for you to be using contraception when you're having um, either one of these chemotherapy protocols. So chemotherapy, because you don't want to be falling pregnant or getting someone pregnant during um, your treatment because you, the drugs that will be going into you to treat your lymphoma can interfere with the development of the baby. Um, so it's important as well for you to protect in yourself and also protecting your partner. If you want to know more about treatments or side effects, please, um, you can visit EBIQ. They've listed the, product, the chemotherapy protocols there and they give a very good extensive list of the potential side effects. So what do you expect after treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma? So up to three months is going to be an active recovery. Your body is going through a lot. Um, these chemotherapy regimes are hard and fast. They, they really do challenge the body. Um, and so it can be easily 12 months of recovery. Um, and that's normal. And people who complete treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma uh, go on and they do, other ha they do have after effects as well, some long-term effects. So what lymphoma survivors should know um, is it's important for you to know what lymphoma you had and what kind of chemotherapy we use to treat that. And if you had radiation or not, and if you did have radiation, what kind? And what kind of late effects are you at risk of developing? And what is the impact on my fertility? So these are a few questions that we listed because again, we wanna empower you as patients to be well informed so that you don't just have to passively participate. Um, this is your life that we're talking about. And so it's important for you to know if your fertility has been impacted. It's important for you to know what late effects you could impact you. And so what are late effects? So any effect that happens more than a couple of months after treatment, um, and some examples include neuropathic pain from surgery, cardiac complications from chemotherapy, Radiation can cause a secondary cancer. So those are some severe ones. Other late effects could be psychological, um, anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, also fertility complications. Late effects could also be practical. You're unable to gain or maintain meaningful employment because you have ongoing fatigue um, or you have insurance discrimination. So any of these things um, could occur. And so therefore living as a survivor of lymphoma um, can still come with its hard, its hard lines and especially in our younger population um, with classical Hodgkin lymphoma it's most common in our 15 to 25 year olds and a lot of those patients go on to develop um, long-term chronic conditions as a result of treatment um, and so it's not always um, a, a cure it doesn't always mean the end of the line and it means that it can still kind of impact your life after. So conclusion, so lymphoma is rare and it can be hard to diagnose and our patients can go, it's not uncommon for you to visit the GP up to five times before a lymphoma diagnosis um, is achieved. Um, there's 80 different types of lymphoma and it can be very confusing and it's important for you as a patient to understand what type of lymphoma you have because the type of lymphoma really impacts the treatment and the long-term effects of that. 10% um, of all lymphomas are Hodgkin lymphoma, and there are two types of Hodgkin lymphoma. That's classical Hodgkin and nodular lymphocyte predominant. So some symptoms of Hodgkin lymphoma and lymphoma in general are lymph swollen lymph nodes, fatigue, fever, weight loss, and night sweats. Um, it's diagnosed through a biopsy, and Hodgkin lymphoma will usually have the presence of that funky-looking B cell, Reed Sternberg cells. Classical Hodgkin lymphoma is treated with chemotherapy, and our first-line treatments usually achieve a positive 90% um, remission rate, but we'll, we still have second-line treatments available for patients who don't respond. Um, yeah, so that's basically a conclusion of Hodgkin lymphoma. If you have any suggestions for future topics for us to talk about at this Lunch with Lymphoma, please, um, they're welcome. Um, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. 
For more information, please feel free to look up our website. We're actually redoing our website at the moment and very excited for the information that the lymphoma care nurses have been developing during this COVID lockdown. We have a fact sheet available on classical Hodgkin lymphoma, which you can get off our website. And we also have one on nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. Not only that, we have a lot of other um, lymphoma fact sheets about other subtypes. So if you've tuned in today and you're not affected by Hodgkin lymphoma, you're affected by another type of lymphoma, please look at our website and have a look at our fact sheets and see if there's one there for your subtype. Lymphoma Australia's YouTube channel with real life patient stories and expert interviews is a great resource for you guys to listen to, to learn more about lymphoma in general, and also hear stories of your own peers who are going through similar experiences. Um, our Facebook group, so Lymphoma Down Under, is open to all groups. And we were very excited last week to launch the brand new Lymph Hodgkin Lymphoma Down Under, which is a new Facebook group. It's private and it's um, aimed specifically at patients and carers affected by Hodgkin lymphoma specifically. So we welcome you guys to, um, I guess, join in on that. Um, for those nurses that have tuned in today, we've got the Lymphoma Nurses Down Under and then Coming soon, we hopefully will have the Hodgkin Lymphoma Relapse Refractory um, uh, Facebook group. If you want to stay up to date with Lymphoma Australia's education sessions and what's new in the lymphoma world, please sign up to our newsletter. It comes out monthly um, and we would love to have you on board as part of our group. Um, you can contact us at nurse at lymphoma.org.au if you want to email us or you can phone that number 1-800-953-081. That's our support line. It's a free service from anywhere in Australia and it's a support line that runs from Monday to Friday through working hours. So that's just a little slide from all of our team at Lymphoma Australia. So any questions, I guess? Is there anything, Donna? Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions there. Thank you so much, Beck. That was a fantastic um, overview and um, very comprehensive. Just sort of shows the diversity of this disease and also all lymphomas, of course, um, and there's so many different subtypes. But again, I guess as a reminder that every patient is different in their treatment and how they cope with treatment and also moving forward after treatment as well. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. The first one um, was a question about CMV virus, um, cytomegaly virus, um, whether it's linked to Hodgkin lymphoma. And the answer is yes. Pretty much any virus can, um, or most viruses can be linked to Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and uh, it's actually, I think it's around about 20% of um, patients diagnosed can have that virus. So anything that can alter the immune system, basically. Yeah. Um, there's also another question that if you want to answer, um, Beck, um, can you see the questions? I actually can't see the questions. Oh, down actually... the bottom. Um, if you click on question Q and A. Oh, here we go. I so can, should I... I can read them out if you can. It's all right. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, please explain the night sweats and each phenomenon. Phenomenon. Oh, okay. word. So um, the night sweats, it's like, I guess, what, what specifically do you want to know? Do you want to know why they're, why what, you're having sweats? Why it happened. Or, yeah. What happens? Well, probably partially because of the, like the disease itself is fast growing. And so it can be quite metabolized. So then it makes the body work quite hard and it can lead to these like sweating like a response to cool the body down from fevers as well. Um, and then your itching, is that, Donna, would you add anything else about the sweats? Um, no, quite often, yeah, nighttime particularly is when our bodies really do sort of try and recover or fight off things, as you mentioned as well. And that's why a lot of people get night sweats for various reasons. Um, and there's also the, the activity of the disease, you're right. Um, the itch phenomenon. The itch phenomenon, so an inflammatory response in the subcutaneous tissue is caused by the lymphoma. So our subcutaneous tissue in our skin, um, the lymphoma can cause, when, it's, when the lymphoma is happening in your body, it causes an immune response. So that's why patients often do have fevers and stuff like that. Not only is the immune system not functioning properly, but also it's kind of like haywire from abnormalities that are going on. And so these things can irritate the... Um, can irritate the um, skin, the subcutaneous tissue. Um, does that kind of make sense? Is that 
Yep, that's great. And some I'll get a question a lot of the time um, of how to help with that itch. And um, quite often it's not until patients will start chemotherapy and get the disease under control and um, settle the immune system is sometimes when the itching will stop. Or another thing you can try is um, obviously keeping your skin as moisturised as possible. No, it's in the, in the tissue, so it's a little bit hard there, but it's also dry skin can actually make it exacerbate the itchiness, but also um, antihistamines. So just even over-the-counter um, antihistamine can assist with that itch, so settling that inflammation response down. Yeah. Um, great. Um, someone, uh, Rebecca, has asked, can you talk about chemo brain or mental fatigue and what causes this um, with chemo? Um, any suggestions on how to manage that brain fog? <laughs> That's a common question. Did you want to start with that one? Yeah, so, um, yeah, chemo can cause um, chemo brain, and people often say, you know, like baby brain, chemo brain, um, and it, it is really difficult. I think suggestions on managing it, honestly, I think probably most patients that I've spoken to say that, like, lists help them, reminders help them, so even in your phone, like, they can just forget, you know, what they were supposed to be doing today or what they were doing, and often kind of, like, just practically setting a plan for each day um, with things that you were going to achieve and writing that down somewhere so that when you're like, oh, wow, I have no idea what I was supposed to be doing, you can look back on something and go, oh, okay, righto, um, I was supposed to go get bread and milk today. Um, so kind of practical suggestions like that, I would say is helpful, um, maybe. Any other suggestions you can say, Donna? Yeah, just maybe planning your day around. Um uh also what causes i guess chemo brain is basically your whole body's gone into doesn't know what is going on really with all the chemotherapy and trying to recover um uh, from treatments and quite often our brain often lacks a lot of that energy i guess up there but a lot of the um reasons for all this is is actually unknown and there's a lot of research that is going into chemo brain and and how to reduce that um but um there's no real cure for it usually time and once your body has recovered it does improve but as beck mentioned some of the um learning some some techniques to how to um to deal with that is is very helpful yeah, um, yeah. It's very frustrating and you're just oh. mentally fatigued as well like your body is going through a lot there's a lot that your body is handling it's like a war going on in there um, and so mentally there's, you know, hormone shifts and particularly in women as well. Um, when we talk about, you know, fatigue and, and also fertility as well, if women are going to, um, preserve their fertility or try and stop their menstrual cycle during the course of treatment that alters their, their function and the flow of their hormones throughout their body during treatment, which can cause, you know, you know, just mental confusion and fog. Um, and so all these sorts of things just, you know, reap haywire with your body. And it's down to you, a lot of the, the energy and all that, everything is trying to get all your cells and everything recover um, mm. from the treatments because it's trying to replace all those cells that we're trying to kill with extra drugs and things too. And, and quite mm. often, unfortunately, um, that the chemo brain is often one of the last symptoms to leave a person as well, as long as, as long as, um, alongside fatigue is um, obviously another common common problem with um, some of these lymphoma um, drugs and everything. But um, it also, um, yeah, chemo brain and quite often, I guess we haven't mentioned that, but the sex drive and things like that are quite often down the track for your body to sort of think about and respond. It's just sort of going to self-preservation really. Yeah. Um, I've got a question here. Um, well, these next two questions probably relate to each other, actually. Um, one from Julie is, um, why do patients get so grumpy when having chemotherapy? And the um, next um, question from Carol is, um, is depression a side effect of treatment? So I guess they can sort of interlink with each other. Do you want to mean, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I think um, one of the reasons patients can get grumpy during chemo is often they're also on steroids. Um, and steroids can make a person a bit more grumpy and a bit more irritable. And so, again, a lot of the chemotherapy we're giving you and then a lot of the side drugs that we give you can cause these side effects that make you more irritable and frustrated and stuff like that. So you get grumpy when you're having chemo, probably because your body is worn out. 
um, and you're going through a lot, we're giving you a lot of these treatments. Some of the side effects of these treatments do make you more irritable. They make you more hungry or, you know, there's just so many changes that are going on in your body. Um, and I think that like, why do patients get so grumpy when having chemo? Probably also just the massive change of life. Like often chemotherapy and treatment um, that lymphoma requires is a full change of life. You know, instead of going to work every single day, you're going to a hospital, you've got a scan, like that's really annoying. And I think anger is a normal emotional response to a diagnosis of cancer or a diagnosis of lymphoma. And so it might not necessarily be a direct result from the, the chemotherapy itself. It might be an emotional journey that you're on and perhaps you're feeling angry because you're justified in feeling angry. Like it's frustrating that you've got to change your whole life and deal with this because of these cells that have become suddenly abnormal. You know, there's no real way for us to prepare for that in life. And so it is really frustrating. And I think is depression a side effect of treatment? Um, yeah, it can be. Um, this whole entire process, um, again, with hormones changing and your body changing, um, and your whole life, like particularly circumstantially, if a person is affected by treatment and they're so fatigued that they can't go back to work after treatment, they might have had a cure of their disease, but those long term effects are living with them and not being able to regain that normality is really frustrating and depressing. It can be very depressing. And so I think that, yeah, depression can be a side effect from treatment. And that's why. Um, part of what we're passionate about at Lymphoma Australia is providing this awareness and support around this so that patients can have somewhere to go to journey these emotional elements with so they don't feel like they're doing it alone. Um, so, yeah, Donna, do you have I don't know, anything else to add on that? Yeah, I, I think you've touched on most of the things. I think, yeah, going through treatment, as you said, that change of whole adjustment period, all the drugs we're going through, there's physical there's emotional there's um mental you know concerns going on too a lot of lack of sleep you might not be sleeping as well as you might do in fatigue quite often um, patients who reported that even you've got fatigue and sleeping well it's not a real restful sleep so quite often that really drains as well and and also the all the appointments um that you're having um can be really quite concerning but also patients who um often report it often is until after treatment, um, even three to six, even nine months after treatment, sometimes when you actually take time to actually process everything you've gone through because Hodgkin lymphoma is a pretty full-on sort of treatment to have, um, whether it's every two weeks or three weeks, you're getting chemotherapy for six months. And that's a long haul and a lot of appointments and treatment and recovery and everything. It's not until months after even sometimes where a lot of patients report that they are feeling um, quite down or have, you know, uh, symptoms of anxiety um, and also not move, being able to move back into what they thought life would be after treatment too. So it's being kind to yourself and, mm -hmm. and remembering that your body needs to recover after treatment as well, just as long as how long treatment took. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another question we've got here is, um, are you finding patients with bulky metastinal masses treated less with radiotherapy now these days to try and limit long-term cancers? Um, yes, I think that that's pretty much the short, long and short of it. So particularly in the um, Hodgkin lymphoma space, as we mentioned during the presentation, the, um, there's a 90% cure rate and like prolonged remission with those patients that are treated. And therefore there's a lot of research surrounding how to reduce long-term effects. Um, so trying to reduce the amount of radiation or reduce the amount of toxic um, chemotherapy agents used in order to try and prevent some of those long-term effects that are happening. So we are finding that with bulky mediastinal masses, they are treated um, less, not less, like Donna, less in total, but we are trying to get away from using radiation as much as possible, particularly in women um, in the chest area, because that can be associated with breast cancer as well. Um, so if we can avoid it, that's definitely something we want to try and do um, to obviously, yes, limit the amount of long-term risk of cancer developing after. Yeah, I guess it's sort of the realising, because they have, as you realize radiotherapy was 
pretty much the one of the key ways of treating these sort of cancers years ago. And I guess now that we're actually getting to points where people, um, especially younger patients, are actually able to survive this 90 to 95 percent of the time with their um, with their initial uh, chemotherapy we're all now thinking about the yeah as you mentioned before the long-term effects for patients so that's where a lot of the research in Hodgkin lymphoma is at the moment as you mentioned so yeah a lot less and also they're trying to keep away obviously from the heart and the lung areas as well to particularly um, because we're already giving toxic chemotherapies that are causing lung and heart issues so we're trying to lessen um, those long-term um, cardiac and, and lung issues for patients moving forward. There's a long life hopefully ahead for people. Yeah. Um, we've got another question here. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any statistics on long-term survival, i.e. way beyond five years for patients with um, nodular sclerosis, Hodgkin lymphoma with metastinal mass from Kim? Okay. So, <clears throat> so currently... Um, I think statistically it's like nine out of 10 people achieve a long-term remission with um, nodular lymphocyte predominant. And that often is 10 years or longer, I think, statistically. So um, already currently, statistically, our patients that are diagnosed with that do actually live for 10 years or longer. Um, so for patients, I don't know. I don't know about the mediastinal mass element, though, Donna. Do you know if there's any statistics around that? Um, it's just in the same sort of um, uh, area as any other disease around the body. Yeah, that's yeah, sufficient. It's very dependent on how bulky that mediastinal mass is. If it's a smaller mass, obviously chemotherapy can um, treat that quite quickly and easily without radiotherapy. But if it is yeah. a more bulkier, like bigger, larger mass where you may need um, further treatment can cause obviously issues down the track. But generally, if you get bit to five years, there's a very low chance of your um, Hodgkin lymphoma relapsing over time. Um, and we just got another question from Kim as well. I guess the last one, unless there's any more questions um, to come, is um, what do you recommend for reducing hormones post-treatment? Mm. You mean... Um, I'm not sure. So that, maybe that means about um, the, the hormone imbalance after treatment, maybe? So I can answer mm. that a little bit if you like yeah. So basically, um, yeah, so hormones can be interrupted with chemotherapy and particularly um, for um, people who are having either um, men or women, actually, um, especially women are having Zolodex injections for their hormones to stop their ovaries from working. Um, they can take about good three months or so at least to start your periods to come back and um, for your hormones to start readjusting. So it can take some people on average, usually about three months, but it can take a little bit longer. I usually recommend for patients to, um, if there are childbearing years and or if you're getting a lot more menopausal sort of symptoms, is to actually get some um, tests through your doctor to sort of see what your hormones are like. There are some people that may go into um, either a, a short menopause, like a, a short one, and then recover back to normal. But it can actually send some patients into um, into menopause as well. So these are sort of things you can you can get blood tests through to see what your hormone levels are, and then getting um, the suitable um, treatment from that. But girls who have had Zolodex injections to stop their um, ovaries, that generally does. Um, uh, reverse the effects, but I have still have known patients to remain in, um, in menopause. But again, if they're being seen by a fertility specialist, I usually recommend from six to 12 mm -hmm. months to definitely go back to your fertility specialist and to um, have a proper work over and work out what's going on. And it can also happen in boys too. This isn't talked about very much. Um, <laughs> male hormones can also be altered through chemotherapy. And I have known um, even a lot of young uh, patients or Hodgkin lymphoma patients who um, have gone into low testosterone levels as well. So those patients I recommend they can have just a simple blood test, get the doctor to add on to their blood test that they're feeling like their mood's low, um, sex drive is a bit low as well, um, or any sort of moodiness and things. It's pretty similar to female menopause um, to actually ask your doctor to add on a testosterone level at the end there just to see what's going on. I have known male patients to have needing um, a testosterone replacement to try and 
even out the, that as well. And there's hormone replacement, obviously, for women as well, um, too. So I hope that answers the question. Um, and, and I think that's, I think that's about it. Um, if there's no other questions. Cool. Great. Oh, thank you, Beck. That was an excellent um, presentation. And, and this has been recorded, everybody. So um, we will post this out to you all and let you know once it's up. And um, we hope you can join us for future um, events in the new fu um, future. We'll be continually posting these up and very open to any suggestions um, of future topics as well. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.